Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to be with you here today. I've been in Switzerland since Sunday, and I've fallen in love with your country, so thank you very much. Um, as mentioned at the beginning, the speakers today represent different perspectives. So um, as a caveat, I'm not a cardiologist or cardiac surgeon or a neurologist. I'm actually a clinical and health psychologist. And today I'll be talking about the neuropsychologic deficits after cardiac surgery, and I'll be talking about the perspective um, after cardiac surgery when these patients come to your clinic complaining of memory and attention problems, kind of things that you can do. So my goal is at the end of the presentation, you'll feel a little more confident in your ability to manage these patients when they present to your clinic. Just briefly, what do we, we, what do we mean when we talk about cognitive impairment? We talk about challenges in memory, attention, processing speed, so how quickly people are able to perform usual mental tasks, concentration, judgment, their ability to do things they used to do, and there can also be accompanying personality changes. There are a number of factors associated with this. Advancing age, medication such as opiates, nutritional deficiency, de deficiencies, dehydration, infection, depression, and heart failure, and I ask you to think about which factors are also common in your cardiac surgical patients, and we'll come back to this again in a few minutes. So a case example, this is somebody I saw um, last year. We'll call him Mr. Toronto, that's where I'm from. 67-year-old man who had aortic valve replacement surgery six months before he was referred to me. He was married, he had two adult children, and he was recently retired from investment banking, which may be familiar with many of you Swiss folks here. He had a very successful career, and he just retired uh, the previous year. He was referred to me because he had memory difficulties and he had a lot of anxiety. When I met him, he said that he couldn't remember, well, he was having difficulty remembering appointments and he was diffi having difficulty managing his personal investments. And his wife was also complaining. She was not complaining about his memory, she was okay with that. She was complaining because he was always complaining and that's what we often see in spouses. So we'll come back to Mr. Toronto at the end. But when we talk about post-operative cognitive decline, it's actually a challenge to come up with the specific incidents that we can quote to our patients. It ranges. When you look at the research studies, short-term cognitive, post-operative cognitive deficits range from 26 to 80 percent, which is a huge range. Longer-term deficits, so up to five years, have been quoted as up to about a third of patients. These have an impact not only for the memory of our patients, but also in terms of overall quality of life. But the data are conflicting. So uh, a few years ago, a study was published, and they compared on-pump cabbage patients with three control groups. So off-pump patients, a group of patients who had coronary artery disease but had not undergone any interventions, and then they had the heart-healthy controls. And they found that of these three groups, no groups had significantly declined scores at a three-year follow-up. And the three cardiac groups all reported, um, all experienced poorer cognitive functioning than the heart-healthy group. So when we think about cognitive uh, cardiac surgery, sometimes it's difficult to tease out what are the effects of the surgery and what are the effects of the heart disease. Another study, the Ruby study, compared over 1,000 patients undergoing bypass surgery. They found no difference between those who were on and off um, bypass. And they found that the patients were more likely to actually demonstrate cognitive improvement than cognitive decline from baseline to one year follow up. So we might be actually um, equally or perhaps more likely to encounter some patients who say that the memory has improved afterwards, perhaps as a result of improved perfusion. And in this study, though, these were the factors that were predictive of cognitive decline. So lower baseline cognitive scores. So we think that people who have a higher baseline cognitive functioning typically have a little more reserve in them. Older age, less education, and ethnicity other than white, and none of these are modifiable. A meta-analysis was published last year looking at cognitive outcomes following bypass surgery, 
28 studies, over 2,000 patients. And they concluded that the omnibus data indicated subtle improvement in cognitive functioning relative to preoperative baseline testing. There are methodological issues, though, and I think it's important to briefly review those. Um, if you read one paper, this is the paper I like, it was published um, six years ago now, and they talk about challenges when you're interpreting research studies looking at cognitive functioning following cardiac surgery. And there are issues related to patient sampling. So oftentimes in research studies, we actually exclude the people at highest risk. So we exclude those at most likely of having a neurologic event after cardiac surgery. It's tricky figuring out an appropriate control or comparison group. Do we compare to heart healthy? Do we compare to other coronary artery disease patients? Do we compare to people undergoing different uh, surgical techniques? Oftentimes when we do a baseline assessment at cardiac surgery, we're assessing them in um, an inpatient, in the ward, where they may not be at their best cognitive status. When we look at these studies, there are challenges with participant adherence. So patients who begin um, with lower baseline scores or who at the initial follow-up have a decline, they're actually less likely to stay in the study. So you're more likely to have people, to retain people in the study who actually have a higher cognitive performance. When we think about tests, um, there are over 350 tests that have been proposed and been used looking at post-operative cognitive uh, decline in cardiac patients. In 1995, a group got together and they recommended four tests that should be used in all subsequent studies, and rarely are those four tests used. So there's a wide range of measurement techniques. And oftentimes, studies fail to recognize other possible causes, such as depression, anxiety, pain, and sedative use. Finally, there's a question regarding post-operative cognitive decline. So do we look at mean group scores or individual scores? When we talk about the group comparison model, if we look at group means, we may be more likely to pick up subtle differences that we don't, we're not re re relying on arbitrary cutoff scores but these can obscure the individual declining scores. And when we're looking at individual changes, we have to figure out how are we going to define declining cognitive function. And there are a lot of different ways to look at that. So a commonly used cutoff is a 20% decline, uh, sorry, 1% standard deviation decline in 20% or more of the tests that we use. But many different studies have different approaches to looking at this. There are statistical considerations, so regression towards the mean reliability of practice effects. And these authors concluded that traditional ways of defining the neuropsych sequelae of bypass surgery tend to provide lower estimates than actually exist. So I'm not really sure when we look at the data whether we're overestimating or underestimating cognitive decline following cardiac surgery. But what I'm most interested in is how we handle this when patients present to our clinic. So if we look at the patient level, there are implications of cognitive impairment for those people who do experience it. A nice study looked at neurocognitive functioning and quality of life, and they assessed neurocognitive assessment at baseline in 261 patients, and they followed them for five years. And they assessed quality of life in 172 of these patients at the five-year follow-up. And they found that the lower five-year neurocognitive scores were associated with poor quality of life. And if we can see here, the top two bars, so th these are looking at general health ratings, and the x-axis is looking at cognitive function scores. We can see that patients with cognitive function scores above the mean were more likely to report excellent and very good health. And it was the folks that were below the mean that reported poor health status. Similarly, the ones that have higher cognitive functioning are more likely to be working full-time or part-time. And I think it's important with a study like this to remind ourselves that we're looking at associations, not causation here. And so we can certainly talk about strategies to improve cognitive functioning, but it'd be interesting to look at whether or not if we improve the quality of life and the mood and depression, if we can in turn improve the cognitive functioning. Another clinical implication has to do with the disease-related challenges. So when our patients are having difficulties with memory or concentration, they will have difficulty 
paying attention to and understanding information that we give them. So we often expect people um, you know, to, to learn, this is how we want you to handle yourself after surgery when you go home. We want to see you in our office in six weeks. We want you to start taking these medications. We want you to monitor your weight on a weekly basis. Um, we ask them to manage complex treatment regimens. So it may be medications for their first time, fluid restrictions, keeping multiple medical appointments. And at least in heart failure, we know that admissions are often due to patient difficulty following complex treatment regimens and recognizing worsening symptoms. So when our patients present to us and they're reporting difficulties with memory, we may need to repeat the same thing several times. We may need to give them information in both verbal and written formats. So how do we manage these patients? There are questions regarding clinical screening. So obviously, if somebody presents to your cardiac clinic, you're not going to do a one or two hour battery of neuropsychological assessment. Oftentimes, people use the mini mental state exam, um, assesses a number of, of fields, so orientation, immediate memory. One study looking at heart failure patients found that it identified one of 12 patients who had genuine cognitive impairment. Draw a clock test is actually a little bit easier. So you ask your patient to draw the face of a clock with all of the numbers and set the time for 10 after 11. But even this only picked up half of the patients that had true cognitive impairment. Instead, I think a nice heuristic model is this ask, tell, ask concept. Ask them whether they are concerned about any cognitive changes. Tell them information they want or need to know and tell them strategies that have worked for other patients. They often really appreciate that. So rather than saying, research shows that, they like it when you say, this is what has worked for a number of my other patients. And then at the end, ask them whether they have understood the information and whether they have any additional questions. The patients that I work with, they don't know whether their cardiologists are world famous. They don't know whether the cardiologists are good at interpreting diagnostic tests, managing medication. They do know when the cardiologists and the nurses are good at talking with them. And I think a lot of <coughs> communication, a little communication, sorry, goes a long way. And we should include partners in these discussions. One study looked at cognitive failures by patients and close relatives before and three months after aortic valve replacement. And they looked at subjective cognitive failures. So these were the, the patients and their, their partners saying, this is what we noticed. They're having difficulties at home with memory, attention, performance. When they looked at the patient's measures, there were no differences in pre and post. When they looked at the partner measures, the partners reported a significant decline from baseline to that three-month follow-up. And actually, it was that partner reported decline that was most associated with poor neurocognitive outcomes at that three-month mark. So in fact, partner reports might be more reliable. So when we talk to our patients, it's a great idea to say to their husband or wife there, just wondering, how do you think he or she is doing since surgery? If you look at this box whisker plot here, once again, we see baseline on the left, post-operative, three-month scores on the right. Once again, the partners are reporting worse ratings of perceived cognitive failures in daily living. So this is, what does it mean for these people to come home? Once again, higher or worse scores were generally associated with worse neuropsych change scores, as well as post-operative anxiety and depression scores. And we often forget that there's a significant correlation between depression and anxiety functioning and our cognitive functioning. We're learning a little more about cognitive functioning as an op sorry, cognitive training as an option. A few months ago, a study was published, and they took 51 patients who had undergone cabbage, and they assigned them to a control group and an intervention that had memory training followed by attention training, and another intervention group that had attention training followed by memory training. They gave them this training between the six and 10 month mark after surgery, and they actually found a significant improvement in domains of memory and attention that were trained. And I'm following, finding that more and more of my patients are presenting to clinics saying, what can we do? Is there anything I can do now to improve? Coming back to these clinical associated factors, these comorbidities, earlier I asked which are common in your surgical patients, and I think we can also talk about which are modifiable.
So as a psychologist, I'm very focused on depression, and I consider depression a modifiable um, uh, risk factor, associated factors. And even when we diagnose depression, we look at things like difficulties with concentration and decision making. So when a patient presents with cognitive decline following surgery, I would ask them about depression or anxiety, and if they're having difficulties, certainly refer them. Heart failure, we certainly always want to optim optimally manage that because about a third to one half of patients with heart failure will have cognitive impairment, and they most commonly report difficulties with memory and concentration. Once again, when somebody presents with clinic, it can be very difficult to tease out what are the specific factors associated with cognitive impairment. I ref for any patient that I see, regardless of cognitive functioning, if they're not engaged in physical activity, I always recommend that. So exercise, great for mood, great for anxiety. For at least 20 years, we've known that it's actually great for, to improve cognitive functioning also. A simple walking regimen, for example. And I think for any of us in here that do exercise, we often feel that we have a clearer head after we're done exercising. Many research studies show that it works. If your patients are coming to clinic and complaining about cognitive functioning, first thing I would do is encourage them to exercise. In Canada, about a quarter, a third of patients actually do cardiac rehab. I understand it's the same in Switzerland. I think it's something we should increase the use of. Finally, I attended Dr. Messerly's lecture on Wednesday. I don't know if there's some association between chocolate and cognitive functioning. Maybe we should encourage our, encourage our folks to eat more chocolate. I'd be very happy to collaborate in an international study looking at this. Um, I will say that I've been eating more chocolate since I've been in Switzerland. I don't think I'm any smarter, but my pants were tighter this morning. So getting back to Mr. Toronto, six sessions of therapy. We did stress management. I referred him to cardiac rehab, and he used an iPhone calendar notebook for daily reminders. Six sessions at the end, his memory was better. It was not impairing his daily life, reduced stress, and his wife was also much happier because he was not complaining as much. In conclusion, the exact incidence of post-operative cognitive decline following cardiac surgery is unknown, and it varies according to a number of methodological variables. <coughs> But when it does occur in a clinical setting, it can be very distressing for both patients and their partners. Unfortunately, we have clinical strategies that can improve. Thank you, Danke, merci, and grazie.